This video is brought to you by KiwiCo. What does KiwiCo do well? Big surprise. I'm gonna tell you. Well, they're redefining the future of play with hands-on projects and toys that are designed to expose kids to STEAM concepts. STEAM is like STEM, except with art thrown in, because, well, why not? Kids love art. KiwiCo comes as a monthly crate that allows kids to learn at home. They're all designed by experts, sensible, tested by kids, also sensible. Each month carries a new theme, and it's all about hands-on learning. There are eight subscription lines for different ages and topics, so you're bound to find something that your child loves. Importantly, everything you need is in the box, so you don't have to go to the store and buy tons of things that you're supposed to have on the hand. I was building a piece of furniture the other day, and I was like, yeah, 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 we included all of the Allen keys so you can assemble this thing, but we assume you have a spanner. I'm like, don't assume, furniture maker. I don't. I don't know, what was I talking about? Yes, KiwiCo. So look, it's the summer, kids spend a lot of time in front of screens, and look, that just makes them dumb. Look, I, I don't know if that's actually true, but I mean, there is that brain drain thing, and I think it's good to combat that, and you can do it with KiwiCo. So get over to their store, find something you'd like to do with your kid, and buy it. Plus, you can just purchase one box, so you don't need to sign up for a subscription. You know, sometimes that's not what everyone wants. Use the code BRAINFOOD, you'll get 20% off everything, or use the link below, and let's get on with the video. If you ever found yourself eating a special brownie or two and not long after have an insatiable urge to partake in a stuffed crust meat lover's pizza, truth, followed by a couple of McDonald's, McGriddles, a Quiznos, Steakhouse, beef dip sub, and then finish it all off with a McFlurry or a fruit and yogurt parfait, well, it turns out you have one man to thank for this and many other staples of the fast food industry, a guy by the name of Tom Ryan, who apparently is an absolute legendary hero. Beyond being something of a da Vinci of the fast food world, Ryan also more recently decided to stop working for the man and start a couple of restaurant trains, which, no surprise, one of them has been the fastest growing in the world since, and the other is quite successful as well. As to all this, he states many established fast food chains have grown into adulthood, gotten complacent. The industry is dynamic, not static. If you're satisfied, you're going to look old fast. So, how did Ryan come to have such an influence on the world of quick eats. As a student at Michigan State University, Ryan started his rather unique career path by studying food science, then followed this up by earning a master's in lipid toxicology, and finally got his PhD in flavor and fragrance chemistry, which apparently are all totally a thing. What do you do? I'm a doctor of flavor. As to why he focused on food-related subjects in his academic career, he actually started out pre-med intending to become a doctor, but notes, I was dating a girl who was interested in food science, and she said, you should check this out. Spring of sophomore year, I took my first food science class. I just loved it. I fell in love with the fact that there was a science behind what most people took for granted, from making ketchup to ice cream. So yes, this girl turned out to be something of a yin zen to Ryan's Tony Stark. Without her, pizza lovers of the world may still be feeling obligated to toss their crusts in the trash rather than bite into cheese-filled or highly seasoned goodness. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. After graduating with a PhD in flavor, Ryan went on to work on things like coffee, cocoa, and peanut roasting for entities like Duncan Hines, Folgers, and Jif. Perhaps most significantly in all of this, he worked on perfecting Pillsbury frozen pizza dough. This all saw him ultimately hired by Pizza Hut in 1988 to take the job as their director of new products. Not an easy task. The then COO of Pizza Hut actually told Ryan, the guy who literally had new products in his job title, Tom, you're in trouble. Everything that can be done in pizza has been done. And that man had no imagination because I can think of things you can do to pizza right now. Like for one, wedding cakes have multiple layers. Where's the pizza equivalent of that pizza? Come on. Ryan took a different stance, stating that thought process really pissed me off to the point where I can remember how I was sitting when he told me, and I can remember his voice. My reaction to it was like, I can't accept that. I went home that night and said, you know, this is how a lot of the world thinks about things. I don't think like that. I'm gonna change the world. Pizza with cheese in the crust. A little over a year later, he dropped the mic to said COO with one of his many major successes in the food industry. 
So what did he do? He states, Working on pizza, I learned two things. That cheese is the most important thing that drives most people's value perception of pizza. The more cheese, the better. No matter how much you put on it, there's never enough. And dogs get to eat the crust because most consumers who aren't bread lovers eat the pizza and then flip the crust to their dog. Remember, this was in an era before the now ubiquitous tasty crusts designed to get around this problem. I don't know if this is such a problem. I eat a lot of pizza. Most of the pizza... I don't know if it's more of an American thing, but it doesn't come with stuff uh, like cheese in the vast majority of pizzas. And I always just dip the crusts in hot sauce. It's really good, but I also love bread. So there's that. Thus, the Eureka moments add cheese to the crust. Like most innovative ideas, as Ryan frequently points out, they always seem simple in hindsight, but nobody had thought of this rather retrospectively obvious solution to the crust problem. Of course, perhaps why it wasn't so obvious was the fact that the execution is surprisingly tricky. At first, you might think to add the cheese to the top of the crust itself like the rest of the pizza. The issue is that this doesn't really distinguish the product that much from competitors, which was half the point. Further, this partially gets rid of the handle people use to hold the pizza without getting their fingers messy and potentially at first burning themselves on the hot cheese. Not a deal breaker, but not ideal for any of these reasons. The obvious solution was to put the cheese inside the crust, which he did, but this too came with issues. In the first test run, he noted the cooked cheese ended up turning out like a bike tire, though it tasted good. The bigger issue was that this changed the dynamics of cooking the pizza as a whole. He elaborates, baking a pizza with cheese in the crust and baking a thin pizza is like baking a turkey into chicken wing at the same time, and so there was a lot of technical work that went into how you design the dough and the pan it's cooked in so that you can have the two parts of the product coming through the same oven in the same amount of time. The vision is only as good as the execution, so we had to do a lot to make the execution work. It took us a year and a half. After the product debuted, however, it was a massive hit, with Pizza Hut selling, according to Ryan, over a billion dollars worth of stuffed crust pizzas in the first year, and seeing overall sales rise about 10% as a a result. He had successfully innovated a supposedly uninnovatable product. Other major hits Ryan achieved while with Pizza Hut included the introduction of the meat lovers, pepperoni lovers, etc. pizzas, which were soon ubiquitous among major pizza chains playing copycats, as with the stuffed crust later. On this one, he stated, The lovers line taught me that great ideas that fit into your everyday operations are easy wins if they are designed and positioned well with the customer. Meat lovers, pepperoni lovers, cheese lovers, all those products were kind of an early win. It was like hitting a bunch of singles, but we scored a lot with those singles. He and his team also introduced Pizza Hut breadsticks, chicken wings, and Sicilian pizza, among other things, during his time heading up new products there. Now, having made a name for himself in the restaurant world, Ryan got the call for a gig at the New York Yankees of fast food chains McDonald's to see if he couldn't work his magic there as the worldwide chief concept officer. And boy, did he. Perhaps his most famous addition while with McDonald's was the McGriddle. As for the inspiration here, he states McDonald's execs tasked him with coming up with a way to increase their breakfast sales. After studying the offerings, he realized a glaring hole in the lineup. Essentially, everything was savory. There was nothing at all sweet on it. And if breakfast diner offerings are any indication, people love them some sweet with their morning savory and bitter coffee. Of course, the obvious thing to do was add something sweet like pancakes or French toast sticks like other fast food chains would try later, but that didn't really fit with what people came to McDonald's for. He states, the big void in our menu was something something sweet in your hand. This was the key to McDonald's. The product has to fit with why people are using you and why you're valuable to them. Thus, we basically took the Grand Slam Denny's breakfast and put it in your hand. And the only little piece of technology we needed was how to get the syrup inside the pancakes so you don't have to have syrup in one hand, sandwich in the other when driving. We worked hard to figure out how to make those little syrup crystals, and once we had that, McGriddles happened really quickly. Not stopping there, among many other tweaks, the McDonald's menu in his years there included the McFlurry, the dollar menu, and of course the fruit and yogurt parfait, an obvious product now, but not so much at the time. I have the fruit and yogurt parfait just must not be a thing in Europe, or at least, I mean, and I know McDonald's. <laughs> I feel like I do at least. I eat there quite often. Never heard of the fruit and yogurt parfait. Guess it didn't make it across the pond. Who knows? Although someone in the comments would be like, Simon, <laughs> you've never heard of the fruit and yogurt parfait. What's going on? 
He states of this one, these days yogurt sales are going up and up and up, but remember this is back in the mid 90s, like a decade before the Greek yogurt explosion, and there wasn't a huge American love affair with yogurt. People were eating it, but they weren't really enjoying it. So the idea I had for the yogurt parfait was to work the fat out of the yogurt, replace it with a little more sugar to make it more palatable for Americans, and then to present it more like a dessert than something healthy. The issue was people weren't crazy about yogurt. When I took the most popular yogurt off the shelves and put my first couple of prototypes in front of consumers, they didn't like it. So for the yogurt parfait, we actually created a vanilla yogurt that tasted more like vanilla pudding but was actually real yogurt, and that set things on the path to success. It got popular really fast as a meal and breakfast replacement, and for many, as a dessert item. From here, Ryan was prized away from McDonald's by Quiznos to serve as the chief branding officer, where he spent some time doing his thing there. Among many other the tweaks and new products at that chain, he spearheaded the Steakhouse Beef Dip and the Prime Rib Sub, now two of the company's most popular products. Perhaps the biggest thing that happened to him at Quiznos, however, was getting to know one Rick Shaden, one of the owners of Quiznos and a man integral to its explosive growth in its early days. You see, at this point, as alluded to, Ryan noted the fast food chain industry as a whole was basically all going the way of the Titanic due to, at the time, being far too set in their ways and unwilling willing to innovate in significant ways to the modern market. Being something of an expert in innovation in this industry, he had major ideas on how one could do better in every aspect of the business. Thus, with Shade and the pair decided to start a new fast food burger chain known as Smash Burgers. Now, while you might think starting a brand new fast food burger chain in 2007 would be tantamount to flushing a lot of money down the toilet, it turns out people actually loved Ryan's tweaks to the classic fast food chain model, and within five years, business was booming, seeing expansion at that point up to 200 stores. The company has also twice been named by Forbes's as America's most promising company, and today they have around 400 locations spanning nine countries. Their recipe for success in this extremely saturated market, as with so many of Ryan's innovations, is design and execute and scale disruptive concepts that are familiar in name, but not very familiar at all in the way they play out. He goes on, We were able to re-qualify burgers because fast food met messed it up in the past. Burgers got commoditized. Restaurants trained people for convenience or quality, but not both. That gave us the space to operate. Simply tweak methods to be able to give people quality and convenience at a fast food chain-like price. On top of that, he states, restaurants could look nicer, could give a nicer vibe than operators that are currently in the segment. This is a point Pieda Italian street food founder and CEO Chris Duty made to me as well. The look and service experience is part of the entire price value equation. Look better and do better and customers feel like they're getting more. Further, to make sure they always stay innovative as with any business, he strongly advocates creating the right culture. He elaborates, One of the things I credit Smashburger in general as a culture is that we were a mix of wise, tenured individuals and we combine ourselves with what I call the immortals, young people in their 20s and 30s who are just dying to get involved in something that they can become passionate about. And I think it's that combination inside our company that is one of the special and and magic reason Smashburger has been able to do what it's been able to do. He also states from quarter to quarter, he now gives all department heads the same mandate. I want three objectives, two that you can get done in the quarter, and one that sees impact in the next quarter. If you can't draw a straight line between these objectives and making a difference around customer satisfaction, executional prowess, or enhanced profitability, then I don't want to see them. The inspiration for the latter part of this mandate was simply observing that most corporate structures, including at the time Smashburger's own, as they had grown so large so quickly, saw executives running things who had absolutely no concept of what went on within the walls of their stores. This inevitably led to objectives that were completely tone-deaf to things on the front end of the company at the restaurants themselves. And thus, objectives that were destined to end in failure and in the worst case actually hurt the company. Not content to stop at just being the CEO of that company, on the side in 2012, we also started another chain called Tom's Urban, more or less a slight rethink of a traditional sports bar type restaurant, again meant to tweak familiar things to fit more modern times when people need much more of a reason to, as he put it, put on jeans instead of sweatpants and go out to a sit-down restaurant instead of having the food delivered right to their door. Naturally, this chain has likewise 
likewise seen steady growth, despite being a bit of a side project. As Tao Ryan keeps an innovative mindset despite now having been in the industry for over four decades and at the point when most of his peers are retiring, he notes he simply applies the same mentality of that of his target customer, the 32-year-old. So why is this the ideal age for customers and mindset for oneself? He summed up his thoughts as such. 32-year-olds are at the age where they are starting to have excess money, reasonably good taste, some experience in knowing what they want, but aren't yet stuck in their ways, so are willing to try new things, and otherwise aren't quite old enough to yet be considered uncool by those of the younger persuasion. As for any plans at winding down his award-winning career, he states, I'm not interested in margaritas and beaching it anytime soon. I have this Nirvana of a situation. I can't wait to go to work in the morning because things are exciting and I can't wait to go home at night. My home life is great. My wife is my best friend and we have a great time even if we're not doing anything. So to me, it's like, why would I interrupt that? So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, smash that like button below. Please don't forget to go and check out KiwiCo. There is a link to them below. And thank you for watching.